Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. J'espère que vous avez jusqu'ici apprécié la deuxième conférence sur les politiques scientifiques canadiennes. As the tradition of the Science Policy Conference, we have always hosted the Minister of Science at our conference and to address delegates. And today, I have the pleasure and honor to be joined by the Honorable Navdeep Baines, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre, bienvenue à la deuxième conférence sur les politiques scientifiques canadiennes pour la première fois à la conférence annuelle. Minister, welcome to the 12th uh, Canadian Science Policy Conference, your first time at the annual conference, and which happened to be a virtual one. <laughs> well, merci, my dad, uh, pour l'opportunité. C'est un honneur et un privilège pour moi. And uh, j'espère aujourd'hui nous allons avoir une très bonne conversation au sujet beaucoup de choses particularly the importance of science and innovation. Uh, it truly is an honor and privilege to be with you uh, at the Canadian Science Policy Conference 2020. I believe this is your 12th annual conference and your first virtual conference. And, and I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to talk about science and innovation with you. Thank you very much, Minister, for accepting our invitation, and we are pleased to have you here with us and look forward to have you in person, hopefully in the next conference uh, in Ottawa. <laughs> That's right. So if you don't mind, I start with a couple of questions. And uh, so the first uh, one, as you laid out uh, the, uh, the text for the questions you just mentioned, we are experiencing the most serious challenge to our economy and since the Great Depression, and rebuilding the economy is a top priority. Uh, given the significant contribution of science and innovation to our economy, how do you see science and innovation can contribute to the recovery process? And what is the plan to ensure this contribution? So it's a great question. And I think uh, context is important. When we talk about the economic recovery, we need to also talk about the role science and innovation has played in terms of dealing with the pandemic. Uh, also in, in terms of just helping Canadians. Uh, if you look at uh, the government's policies when it comes to our health policy, when it comes to our economic policy, science and innovation has been a key driver in many of the decisions we have made. Uh, for example, we open up all our programs, all our science-related programs, uh, particularly at ISET, at Innovation Science and Economic Development, as well as innovation-related programs to pivot quickly to support Canadians, to support to support frontline healthcare workers. Um, and one particular uh, program that was very popular was a strategic innovation fund that we used to help support domestic vaccine and therapeutic initiatives. Uh, we invested in companies like Medicago, uh, for example, or Abcelera, uh, or PNI, or VDI. Um, and so we're very excited about those investments and using those kinds of tools. And we also invested over $2 billion in science, including the NRC Pandemic Response Challenge Program. In this particular area, we focused on testing and looking at PPE and what kind of ways can we get researchers to work with entrepreneurs to quickly take these new, exciting research-related ideas and commercialize them to help, again, support our efforts to combat uh, COVID-19. And I can tell you right now, science uh, will play a critical role as we move forward uh, in terms of not only the economic recovery, but we want to do it in a sustainable way. We want the recovery to reflect our climate policies. We want our recovery, recovery to reflect the fact that we want to proceed in an inclusive manner. And so science will play a critical role in that, science and innovation. And we're going to continue to make additional investments and, and, and develop partnerships with the research community, with the academic community, in dealing with investments, for example, in climate change, which is going to be a key component, as you'll see in the coming weeks and months, as part of our long-term economic recovery plan. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, in recent weeks, there has been some criticism about superclusters that they have not advanced as originally planned or not received funding on time and therefore significantly behind. Uh, I want to ask for your response to this criticism and also what do you think the long-term expectation from super clusters is realistic and how are SMEs and big versus big firms benefiting from this program? So I think if you look at the super cluster initiative, it really is a long-term initiative. It's not designed to 
uh, generate innovation overnight. Innovation uh, takes time. You want to create a culture of innovation. And what we wanted to do in this initiative was really break down the silos that existed. What problems were we trying to solve? Well, we want better collaboration between industry and government. We want better collaboration between industry and academia. Uh, we want larger businesses to better integrate with smaller businesses and their supply chains. So how do we do that? We use our convening power to create uh, these platforms, uh, these networks across the country. And these were industry-led uh, uh, initiatives. And what's exciting is, as of today, there are over 220 innovative projects that have come forward because of these superclusters across the country in the five different superclusters that exist. Uh, we've seen over $800 million worth of investments. And what's really promising about that is the majority of those investments are the private sector uh, dollars. So it's not simply about government investment. It's the private sector unlocking capital and making investments in these ideas, in these companies, in these researchers, uh, in, and in these entrepreneurs. Uh, and the network is phenomenal. There's over 4,600 members, including uh, hundreds of academic institutions uh, across the country. So that's exciting. And so it speaks to the ambition of breaking down those silos, of creating a more collaboration, of promoting more partnerships. And we're excited about the fact that this is part of our government's overall jobs and growth agenda. Uh, we've seen thousands of jobs created thus far, and we're confident going forward to create good quality middle-class jobs. And the timing of the super clusters is important to note as we're thinking through the economic recovery, as you asked at the beginning, this initiative will enable us to rebound more quickly uh, because it's up and running and it's, it's, really, it's really empowering a lot of researchers and entrepreneurs and innovators across the co uh, country to step up in a big way. Uh, Minister, the pandemic has had a major impact across the innovation ecosystem. Uh, you mentioned some of those. This includes SMEs, as well as universities and colleges who are struggling with lower revenues, especially from fewer international students. What is the plan to support the innovation ecosystem, specifically both SMEs and post-secondary institutions, as they weather the pandemic? So we've been very clear that we want to support uh, our international students. We want to support our academic institutions. Uh, if you look at it from an economic perspective, uh, our international students contribute $23 billion to the Canadian economy. And so one of the initiatives that we are very keen on promoting is uh, the fact that if you're an international student, you can complete 50% of your studies online. Uh, which provides that flexibility for students to start in another jurisdiction as we're dealing with border challenges, as we're dealing with travel restrictions. And so that's an initiative that has enabled international students to have that Canadian experience, uh, be it online, but they can continue that for the coming months and years. And so that's a very important initiative. Uh, we've also focused on how we can support our research uh, enterprises, um, and particularly our universities. Uh, we've invested $450 million to support and stabilize our research enterprise. This is about providing wage support uh, to our researchers. This is about uh, also assisting them with the ramp-up costs associated with research. Uh, and then above and beyond that, when it comes to students, uh, and including our international students, we've invested $291 million to extend graduate and postgraduate scholarships fellowships and grants. We think this is important to continue to see that continuity with uh, these highly educated, highly talented uh, segment of our society. Um, and then when it comes to uh, innovative companies, particularly those uh, companies that are pre-revenue, that are just leaving universities and colleges and that are uh, starting to commercialize their idea, through the Industrial Research Assistance Program, which is a very popular program designed to support these companies. We've invested uh, $250 million, again, to support them uh, through these difficult times. So these are significant investments we've made. Bottom line is these dollar numbers reflect our commitment to helping smaller businesses, uh, to helping our researchers, uh, to stabilize our research efforts uh, and to make sure, again, as we come through this pandemic and as we're dealing with the economic recovery, that uh, we're able to rebound quickly, uh, that the, the, the rebound and the recovery happen in a manner that accelerates some of these investments to create more opportunities for Canadians. 
Thank you, Minister. I want to uh, switch gears toward another topic. Uh, we had the announcement of the reappointment of our Chief Science Advisor, uh, which was, by the way, uh, great news for everyone. And I'm wondering if you could give us examples where her scientific advice has been listened to or taken pre-COVID or during COVID. I'm asking this because uh, prior to the establishment of the role of a Chief Science Advisor, we were all reasoning and encouraging uh, this position. Uh, that uh, mentioning that the establishment of such role uh, that science needs to be uh, present at the highest levels of decision making to be present at the cabinet table at the prime minister's office could you give us a real example or examples that this has materialized so i'm glad you mentioned that because we as a government uh, believe in evidence-based decision making we believe in science and we believe in good quality reliable data one of the first things I did was reinstate the mandatory long-form census. And so uh, that was a point of pride. Uh, we unmuzzled scientists uh, shortly thereafter and saying, look, talk about your work. Be proud of what you do. Talk about the data and the science uh, in a public way. Uh, that's a point of pride for us. Uh, we followed that up with uh, significant investments in science in 2018, as you full well know. The largest and most historic investment in science took place uh, in fundamental research. We were very proud of that. And in 2017, we appointed Dr. Mona Niemer, uh, and that was very exciting. And uh, to your point, uh, we're very thrilled about the fact that uh, we're extending her appointment by two years, uh, which is a signal that science will continue to play a prominent role in our government's decision-making process. And I am in constant contact with Dr. Mona Niemer. Uh, we talk often. She engages directly with the Prime Minister as well. And she's involved in many different initiatives. Uh, if you look at the Immunity Task Force uh, that's run by Dr. David Naylor, uh, she's actively engaged in that initiative, and they recently provided their findings uh, a few days ago. Uh, she's also involved in the Vaccine Task Force. As you full well know, we've made significant investments in, in domestic vaccines as well as international vaccine candidates, and she's providing guidance and advice based on the best available science to make sure that we make sound decisions as we move forward in this endeavor. Uh, and then, I, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, science is going to play a critical role in the long-term economic recovery of Canada. And so she's been a key member of our industry strategy council uh, that's been helping formulate initiatives around strategic support for key sectors as we think through the economic uh, recovery. And so those are examples of where she's played a critical role. And one area that she's very proud of, and so are we, is the initiative of, of CAN uh, COVID. This is a bottom-up approach uh, where researchers and scientists can share best practices. This is a national network uh, based on health. Uh, and so we're very excited about that initiative that she's involved in as well. And so these are just some examples of, of where Dr. Mona Niemer has stepped up in a big way. Uh, but there's so much other work that she does in promoting science and promoting the government's agenda in terms of the investments we've made in science through her appearances in, in public forums and in the media. And so I look forward to working with her uh, and the community as well in the coming months and years. Thank you, Minister. As uh, you may know, of course, your office knows that uh, we, we are pleased and happy to have the partnership with uh, Dr. Nemer's office on Science Meets Parliament uh, established 2018, and we are hoping to have the second round uh, soon uh, this year. And uh, uh, it's a great privilege to working with that office and quite happy about this. But may I ask as a follow-up question, how do you see the role of science advisor has evolved since three years ago? And, uh, and how would you, would you like to see in the next two or three years? So your, your assessment is is correct. The role has evolved. Uh, I think one of the most exciting elements is breaking down the silos within the different departments of making science more prominent uh, as part of the decision making that's taking place and the analysis and the work done in different departments. So what the science advisor has been able to do is demonstrate better collaboration with uh, cross government, have a whole of government approach when it comes to science. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that, that type of collaboration is going to be essential for us because many of the decisions we make are going to be based on sound science, particularly as we deal with uh, the health crisis, but as well as the economic policies that we want to move forward with. And so uh, her role is, is dynamic. She engages uh, with 
uh, different ministers, the prime minister directly, and with my office. And that level of access and interaction is, is really important to make sure when we have conversations and we do analysis around sustainability, when we do analysis around uh, uh, GBA+, plus, that science is also prevalent in the analysis that we do uh, when we make decisions. So we're very proud of the fact that as, as a government, when we move forward and communicate to Canadians the investments that we're making, the programs that we put in place, the policies that we have, they're founded in conversations and discussions and based on the best available science. And that's really driven by Dr. Mona Niemer and her ability to collaborate with so many departments. So that evolution has been very positive. And that was the vision we had when we, we appointed her and we made this uh, position of the chief science advisor a prominent role within our government. Thank you, Minister. Um, science and research has been uh, brought to the forefront because of COVID-19. As a Minister of Science, what opportunities, in your opinion, does the pandemic present for the scientific community going forward? Well, I, I, I want to highlight one great example and someone who I've become very fond of and I've talked to on many occasions, uh, Dr. Art McDonald, our Nobel laureate. Uh, he is someone who stepped up in a big way for Canada. Uh, when we had the call to action to ask uh, Canadian researchers and scientists and entrepreneurs and innovators to provide us with solutions around personal protective equipment, uh, he uh, worked with other uh, like-minded scientists uh, to use off-the-shelf parts uh, to build a ventilator. Now that is being manufactured here in Canada. Uh, and so that's an example of science uh, playing a big role. Uh, that's an example of science being used to solve a problem. Uh, and so that, for me, is a point of pride. Uh, Dr. Art McDonald is someone who is well-known, well-recognized for his efforts. And for him to take time uh, to support us and to support Canadians and to support frontline healthcare workers at this critical juncture uh, was so meaningful. And it just, again, elevated the importance and the role of science in our efforts to deal with COVID-19. And, and so that was truly a point of pride for me. Thank you, Minister. And last question. Uh, it's about CSBC. We cannot let you go without asking this question, obviously, for our benefit. You're familiar with our work over the course of years, as well as, you know, Science Meets Parliament and the workshops in science policy. In your opinion, Minister, what value does CSBC contribute to the community as a national hub for science and innovation policy as a nonprofit, non-advocate organization? So I think the key word there uh, is national. Uh, you truly have a national network, and uh, we need to to recognize that we need to have a pan-Canadian approach when it comes to science, uh, that we have amazing science uh, uh, scientists across the country that need to be engaged, uh, that need to have strong advocacy work done on their behalf. And so I think that pan-Canadian approach is important. Your leadership at the national level has helped us enormously in the past, and we look forward to working with you and other like-minded organizations. And having this dialogue around science is critical. Uh, it's important uh, for uh, future generations, for young people to see how important science is uh, in terms of public policy, in terms of making our lives better and finding solutions to problems. Uh, this is an area where Canada is recognized globally. We punch well above our weight. We represent 0.5% of the world's population and over 2% of the publications. And so that's a point of pride. And so I really believe uh, that the Canadian science policy um, uh, and your organization and the conference that you have today really enables us to highlight the importance of science. And, and that's something that myself as the Minister of Science, I take great pride in. Uh, whenever I have the opportunity, I underscore the importance of science and the work that we do. And it, we need to do that with uh, organizations across the country, including the efforts that you have undertaken. And so I want to thank you. For, for your leadership uh, and uh, your continued efforts going forward. Thank you very much, Minister, for the kind words. We look forward to working with you, and thank you on behalf of the community for the work you do at the Ministry. Uh, Minister Navni Baines, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, I hope you had the chance to capture some of the sessions of the conference, the virtual, and I just want to mention that also we were honored and pleased to receive an op-ed, the featured editorial uh, at our Science Policy magazine, the annual magazine, is from Minister Baines. I encourage people to read that. But once again, thank you. Merci beaucoup and look forward to see you in future occasions. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Au revoir.